Well, welcome to the final part of our Bible series. We're bringing it into land with hope. Where is our ultimate home? You know, we humans, we are hope-oriented creatures. Without the prospect of a future worth living for, we lose the will to live. But hope is a powerful force. It can motivate us to live bold, generous and confident lives. You know, a few years ago, uh, our family went up Mount Snowdon, which is the highest mountain in England and Wales. And it was a hot summer's day and our children were five and seven years of age. And so about halfway up, they had a complete meltdown and refused to go on. It was made a bit worse because there's actually a train up Snowdon. And so every so often a train would pass with people waving happily as our children threw their tantrums. So we negotiated a peace deal and said, look, if you go another five minutes to this near horizon, uh, when we get there, you can decide whether we go on or or turn back. So we went on to the five minute horizon. And from there, we got a glimpse for the first time of the summit of Snowdon. And I pointed to it and I said, now look, there's the summit of Snowdon. Can you see it? They nodded, they could see it. And I said, and can you see just to the side of it, there's a little building. That is a cafe with an enormous ice cream for each of you and the train waiting to take you back down. What do you want to do? (laughs) Hope is a powerful force, right? It can motivate a five-year-old to walk to the top of Snowdon. Hope puts something glorious on that far horizon and says, go for it. Unfortunately, when we reached the summit, uh, it was so busy, they'd sold out of ice creams and the train was fully booked for the rest of the day, uh, which gave us a great opportunity as we stomped back down the mountain to explain to our children that all hopes in this life will ultimately disappoint. Uh, It was not happy. But we have a hope at the end of the Bible story that is sure and certain. Hope, Christian hope, put something glorious on that far horizon and says, go for it. It's a hope that says, we have an eternal future to look forward to, and nothing can take that away. So in the middle of the challenges of life, look up and realize we have hope. Now the end of the Bible then, the final book of the Bible called Revelation. If you like, Revelation, for all of the strange visions and peculiar symbolism in the book, Revelation ultimately gives us a glimpse of that far horizon. And the way this hope works, the way this message is going to work, is we're going to see what lies on the far horizon. So imagine us standing where we are now. Of course, there is a a near horizon, which is life in this world, the next few months and years, all of the challenges and uncertainties and threats. But Christian hope starts with the far horizon. We see a great hope on that far horizon and that hope shines back to give light and encouragement and confidence in the middle of the challenges of life. So let's start then by looking at the far horizon and then we'll see what that can do for us on the near horizon, the challenges of everyday life. But the far horizon we start with is the hope we have for eternity. A sure and certain, a glorious hope beyond this life. Now, before I give us a glimpse from Revelation of what lies on that far horizon, I realise some of you may be thinking, well, this is all very encouraging, but how do you know? I mean, how could you know? You've not been to the far horizon, so how could you know what's going to be there beyond death? No one seems to come back from the far horizon to tell us what lies beyond death, so how do we know? Isn't this all just speculation, like Dante's comedy or some sitcom about the afterlife or the good life? How can we know? Well, the answer the Bible gives is we know what's coming ahead of us because of an event that has happened behind us in history. Listen to the way 1 Peter, uh, a book in the New Testament, puts it. It says, we have been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice then that the living hope that we have is based on the resurrection of Jesus that has already happened. Around April 30 AD, Jesus Christ was brutally crucified on a Roman cross. He was properly dead and buried on Friday. But on Sunday, Easter Sunday, as we now celebrate it, resurrection life infused that corpse of Christ and he came to life again and triumphed over death. 
Now, this hope of resurrection then is embodied in Jesus Christ. If you like, the future has already happened in the past. The moment of the resurrection is the future of our human story if we are in Jesus Christ. And notice this is resurrection. It's not resuscitation, it's resurrection. This wasn't just someone who was very ill and then made a remarkable recovery only to die again. No, no, Jesus properly died but he, he broke through death. He went beyond death and out the other side, never to die again. Now reigning in a human body that is no longer susceptible to disease or sickness or illness or death. Jesus Christ then, if you like, is the first human to make it to that far horizon. He is our future. He is the far horizon in person. And so our confidence about what lies ahead of us is because Behind us in history, Jesus Christ has broken the power of death and shown us the way forward. So we can be certain, confident in this hope. It's not just wishful thinking. Here's how uh, one other verse in the New Testament, in Hebrews 6, it simply puts it this way. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Think of it as I speak hear the word anchor, I, I like mountain climbing and rock climbing, think of it like a team of rock climbers arriving at the foot of a, of a cliff face. One of the team, the lead climber, takes on the cliff face on behalf of the whole team. All the hopes are vested in this lead climber. They face the threat and challenge of pioneering the route, but if they make it to the top, they set up what's known as an anchor or a belay point. They fasten the rope to the rock. And then the rest of the team can climb up behind them, but now they are roped to the one who's already made it. They're going where he's already gone. He's bringing them up to his position. That's how the Bible thinks of our hope. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, it's like we get clipped in, roped to him. He has already made it to the far horizon and he is bringing us to where he is, resurrection hope. We may slip, but wrote to Jesus, he will not let us fall. He's bringing us to glory. Now, one of the things that every climber, one of the moments you love is called topping out. It's where having faced the challenge of the cliff face, your, your head then pops up over the horizon for the first time and you see the destiny you've been going for. What a moment it will be for us human beings when we top out from the challenges and threats of this life and into the glorious hope of eternity. When we see Jesus Christ face to face, we're told in the Bible, it's not just that when we see him, we will be with him. We're told that when we see him, we will be like him. We will enter into his state of being, his quality of resurrection life will become ours. Jesus Christ is our future. Now in the book of Revelation, we get some glimpses of what this topping out into the far horizon hope will be like. Just listen to some of the, well, some of what we've got to look forward to as we put our trust in Jesus. Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with humans. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither will there be mourning or crying or pain for the former things have passed away. And then Revelation 22, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The, tree, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Here we get a glimpse of that far horizon. From where we are in history, we glimpse the hope of eternity. And what do we see? We see Firstly, a renewed planet. A renewed planet. Did you notice that we see not just people wafting around like ghosts in clouds? No, no, John says, I saw a new earth. We know what earth is like. It's the planet where we live, home. But John says, I saw a new home, a new earth, 
and it's been washed clean of all that breaks it and defiles it, and now it's flourishing in the way that was always intended. He saw a new earth, and he even saw the tree of life. Did you notice that? The tree of life reappears. We've only seen that in Genesis, back in our origins, where we started this series. And then we lost access to that symbol of perfection, but now it's back, as if to say our human story started in a beautiful world, filled with the goodness of God, and despite all the chaos in the middle, it's going to finish back in a beautiful world. The tree of life and the tree of life regained, paradise lost, paradise regained. You know, in spite of all the understandable eco-anxiety and the sense of the damage we're doing to our environment right now, the Bible finishes with a hope, and the hope is that this planet will be renewed. And that society and nature, humans and animals, we will dwell in one sustainable, glorious ecosystem forever. A renewed planet. Secondly, resurrection bodies. Did you notice John says in his vision, God spoke and said he will wipe away every tear. There'll be no more crying or mourning or pain for the old order has passed away. We're so used to these frail bodies of ours, catching diseases and getting sick and becoming injured and becoming frail and having disabilities. And we're so used to this, we think it's normal. It's not normal. And it's not the future for those who are in Christ Jesus. No, no, resurrection bodies will mean we get a new kit. (laughs) Are you looking forward to a new kit? One that is no longer corruptible. It won't die. It won't get sick. There'll be no need to cry anymore. The bodies we will inhabit will be like Jesus who in his resurrection appearances ate fish with his friends and walked down the road with other friends and showed us a physical glorious future. You know, whatever your physical body is like now, you have the hope of a new body, a resurrection body in Jesus. And in that sense, even if you are gym toned and ripped and fit right now, don't get proud in the body you've got, it'll still get sick and die. But if you're living in a frail body and you you feel like your best years are behind you, don't despair. I want to say, actually, if you've put your faith in Jesus, your best days lie ahead of you. One day, you will no longer be a shadow of your former self. Right now, you're just a shadow of your future self. Your best days lie ahead of you, a resurrection body. And then finally, a renewed planet, resurrection bodies, and then reunion with God and with his people. Did you notice in the passage, it says that God will dwell with humans. Right now, we can have a relationship with God, but he can still seem quite distant at times. It's hard to hear his voice and know exactly how to live his way, but that will change. One day, we will be so close to God, there'll be no separation or division. In fact, the whole earth will be described in Revelation as the temple. That is that the home of God, the temple is now the whole earth. We will live in a shared space with God in total proximity with him and with his people. That is what we will top out into in glory. That is our future hope. What a hope we have to look forward to. Can you imagine what it will be like to enter into it? I think the best attempt to sum this up comes, I quote this in the series book, but C.S. Lewis in The Last Battle, he pictures Uh, creatures arriving in this ultimate world and he says this it was the unicorn who summed up what everyone was feeling he stamped his right forehoof on the ground and neighed and cried I have come home at last this is my real country I belong here this is the land I've been looking for all my life though I never knew it till now the reason why we love the old Narnia is that sometimes it looked a bit like this. Bree he he, come further up, come further in. We will neigh and sigh and dance and celebrate in that new creation. And that's our hope, secured in the resurrection of Jesus. And this is the hope that can get us through the tough times of life. This hope anchors our small, fragile lives to a better story and gives us a security when we face loss and tragedy. And we're going to hear the story from a family who experienced tragedy, but experienced it with this living hope. It was 2016. I was sitting in the sitting room with my husband, Sammy McCauley. All of a sudden, headache appeared from nowhere. 
ended up to be something very serious. He ended up in Addisbrook Hospital, diagnosed of brain hemorrhage. Sammy was in a discoma for a few months. The doctor's reports were saying that Sammy would never walk again, Sammy would never talk, Sammy would never regain all his memory. But to God be the glory, Sammy recovered and beyond. Unfortunately, even after making a full recovery a couple years later, my dad unexpectedly passed away. Uh, for me, my heart genuinely sunk just hearing the words, time of death from the paramedic. It was a surreal feeling for my entire family. <sighs> yeah, it was just... The air was filled with silence, complete stillness at the time, and just the overwhelming love that poured in from the Kingsgate family. It felt like a big hug, that a spiritual hug that was needed it was really needed at the time. Despite feeling a sense of loss and grief at the time, I had an overall sense of peace and calmness because my dad had confidence in his faith and he believed in God and he knew that there was hope for eternal life, which makes me really confident that I'm going to be able to see him again in the future. Eternal hope is a beautiful thing, especially in the context of losing my dad. Um, I really feel like it helped put a lot of things into perspective for us as a family. Um, and the Bible talks about hope, how it's a part of faith. Um, Hebrews specifically says that faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. And for me, that just meant that, you know, I can be confident that my dad lived his life here and fulfilled his purpose. I can be confident that he's in a better place as well. And I can be assured that as a family, we'll be reunited again later on in life. Um, and also that there will be no more sadness, there'll be no more pain. And I feel like that's our confident eternal hope. Well, as we've seen, hope is vital. When the tragedies and tough times of life come, hope says, but that's not the end of the story. On that far horizon, we still have that moment of reunion and hope to look forward to. And so that far horizon hope that we've already considered shines back to this near horizon and gives us the resources we need to live bold and generous lives. Hope gives us the confidence we need in the face of life's uncertainties. You know, that's the challenge of living in this insecure near horizon is we don't know what's around the next corner and fear of the future can rob us of peace and joy in the present. If we think that this life is all we have, we can become over anxious and risk averse and fearing the worst. Fearing that, well, you only live once and then the fear of missing out kicks in and we, we fear that we won't get all of the things on our bucket list done before we kick the bucket or we won't marry the prince and live in the castle and have the dream. But hope says actually this life is not all that you've got. Ultimately, our home lies on that far horizon and with faith in Jesus Christ, that's where we're going, roped to him. So we can live secure lives knowing that whatever happens here and now, nothing can ultimately snatch away our hope. Whether you get the grades or miss out on that place, whether the boss calls you in to offer you a promotion or say it's redundancy, whether the test results say it's benign or malignant, we have a hope that is bigger than all of those uncertainties. As the New Testament verse that we read earlier puts it, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Every year I go sailing with some friends uh, and uh, they're very confident at sea and I sort of make the tea. I'm not so confident in boats. But one time we sailed to the Isles of Scilly and overnight we dropped anchor just off one of the islands and in the night a squall whipped up and I was anxious and fearful. I couldn't sleep. I was sort of pacing the boat and eventually I woke up the owner of the boat, my friend, and I explained the situation and he sort of assessed what was going on. And then I'll never forget, he looked at me and he just said, have you seen the size of our anchor? <laughs> Go back to sleep, we're fine. 
You know, I want to say to you in the storminess of life and all its uncertainties, nevertheless, have you seen the size of our anchor? We are roped to the risen Jesus Christ, who's already on that far horizon. We can sleep well and live securely because we have an anchor for our souls, firm and secure. And then as well as living confidently, we can live courageously. We can live bold, generous, big horizon lives because we know that ultimately our final hope is secured. So we don't need to live worrying about ourselves and selfishly only looking after our own pile and trying to get as much pleasure as we can and eking out our existence and then dying with those deathbed regrets of I wish I'd taken more risks. We can break out of those small horizons to say, look, if, if, if God has my ultimate future secured, I can live a bold, generous life in the present. As the coronavirus pandemic hit, I was reminded of a book by Rodney Stark called The Rise of Christianity, in which he argues that early Christianity flourished precisely when the plagues came in the ancient world, because when the plagues came and everyone else fled, it was the Christians with this hope who moved into the danger areas and cared for the sick and the dying, risking their own lives secure in the hope that they had. You know, the truth is when we have hope on that far horizon, we become even more useful and generous and transformative here and now. Christians with hope can do extraordinary things and change the world. Ending oppression, speaking out for justice, caring for the sick and dying. As Archbishop Desmond Tutu put it, I'm not an optimist, but I am a prisoner of hope. If we're Christians, we're prisoners of hope. We cannot believe anything but the best for the ultimate outcome of this human story, our world. We cannot give up on this world. We won't write anyone off in it because we're people with hope. And that inspires us to live bold, big, generous lives until Christ returns. Well, and here endeth the Bible story. Here endeth the Bible series. You know, this is how the book of Revelation brings the story into land. In other words, we've arrived at the end, and yet we are still caught up in the middle. I love this little visual on the front cover of the series book. You are here. Before the ultimate eternal city and eternal hope, we are still caught up in this amazing story. We have a part to play today, and we need to be inspired by this hope to make every difference that we can. You know, all of the major events in the Bible other than the return of Jesus, have already happened. They're already history. We've seen our origins, the great event of Exodus, the story of exile, the Messiah coming, the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. This has all happened. The only big event left in the Bible for us is the return of Jesus Christ. So in the meantime, we've got work to do to bring change and hope into our world. When I used to play rugby, sometimes towards the end of a match, we'd ask the referee, how long left, ref? And if it was right at the end of the game, he'd sometimes reply, the next whistle you hear will be the final whistle. Now, when you heard that, it just made you feel, well, then let's let's go for it. I mean, let's not hold anything back. Let's leave everything on the pitch. You know, in the Bible story, the next whistle we hear will be the final whistle, the return of Jesus Christ, ushering in our eternal hope. So let's go for it. Let's not hold anything back. All the sacrifices and risks we take in Jesus' name, for eternity, they'll be worth it. Let's leave everything on the pitch, living out our living hope. Well, I want to invite you at the end of this series then to dedicate your life to serving Jesus Christ until he returns. Perhaps you'd like just to lift your hands as a sign of offering your life and I'd like to pray over us as we finish. Almighty Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus and giving us through his resurrection a living hope that nothing can snatch away. In the uncertainties of life, thank you that we have confidence. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Have you seen the size of our anchor? Lord, in the light of of us being roped to you, may we live bold, generous lives that transform our world until Christ returns. In his name we pray it. Amen.